astronauts floating in space suddenly spot something impossible streaking below them. It's not a satellite or rocket, but a jet black aircraft moving faster than anything should be able to fly at that altitude. This is the legendary SR-71 Blackbird, and in 1986, pilot Brian Schull pushed it so hard during a deadly mission over Libya that it may have actually crossed into space itself. The plane outran every missile fired at it while climbing higher than any aircraft was ever designed to go. But did this Cold War spy plane accidentally become the first manned aircraft to touch the edge of space? And what secrets about that night are still hidden in classified files? The Blackbird that touched space. The year was 1960, and American intelligence had just suffered its worst nightmare. A U-2 spy plane, flying what everyone thought was safely above Soviet missiles, got shot down over Russia. The pilot was captured, the mission was blown, and suddenly, the whole world knew that America had been secretly watching from the sky. Washington faced a terrifying reality. If the Soviets could reach the U-2, nowhere in the atmosphere was safe anymore. This crisis landed on the desk of one man who would change aviation forever. Clarence Kelly Johnson ran a secret division inside Lockheed called Skunk Works, hidden deep in the California desert. His job was simple, but seemed impossible. Build a plane that could fly so high and so fast that no missile on Earth could touch it. The government didn't just want another spy plane. They wanted something that could outrun death itself. Johnson and his small team started working on what they called the A-12 project, a ghost aircraft that existed only in classified blueprints and whispered conversations. Every single part had to be completely different from anything that had ever flown before. Regular aluminum would melt at the speeds they were planning, so they needed something much stronger. The answer was titanium, a metal that could survive temperatures over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. But here's where the story gets really wild. The world's biggest supplier of titanium was the Soviet Union, the exact same country they were building this plane to spy on. So the CIA had to set up fake companies and phony contracts to secretly buy tons of Soviet titanium, then use it to build an American aircraft designed to watch Moscow from the edge of space. The Russians were literally providing the materials for their own surveillance, building the impossible machine. The plane that emerged from this crazy situation looked like nothing anyone had ever seen before. The SR-71 Blackbird had a long, knife-like nose and wide, triangular wings that could slice through air at three times the speed of sound. But the most striking thing about it was the color, completely black from nose to tail. This wasn't just for looks or intimidation. The black paint actually helped the aircraft radiate away the incredible heat that built up when it flew at supersonic speeds. The engineers discovered something amazing during testing. When the Blackbird was sitting on the ground, its metal panels looked loose and misaligned with gaps between them. Fuel would actually leak out and form puddles under the plane because the panels didn't seal properly. But once the aircraft hit Mark III, something magical happened. The friction from moving through the air heated up the entire body so much that the titanium expanded and suddenly all those loose panels stretched tight and sealed perfectly like armor forged by fire. To hide from radar, Johnson's team created angled surfaces they called Chinese edges that would scatter radar waves in useless direction. This was actually an early form of stealth technology, years before that word became part of military vocabulary. Even the engines were works of art. Two massive Pratt and Whitney J-58s that could push the aircraft beyond 85,000 feet, where the sky turns from blue to black, and you can see the curve of the Earth. The SR-71 wasn't just a machine of war, it was a doorway to the edge of space. This jet would eventually fly so high that astronauts orbiting above could see it gliding below them like a black spear slicing through the atmosphere. What started as a response to fear and crisis became something much bigger, a triumph of human ambition and a plane that literally reached for the stars. Life at the edge of space. Flying the SR-71 
wasn't like piloting any other aircraft. At 85,000 feet above Earth, the air is no longer blue. It fades to black, thin, and deadly. The pressure is so low that unprotected human blood would literally start to boil. This is where the Blackbird lived, in a realm where jet engines struggle to breathe and the human body begins to shut down. To survive up there, SR-71 pilots wore pressurized suits identical to those used by NASA astronauts, complete with oxygen packs and gold-tinted visors that protected their eyes from cosmic radiation. Each mission was less like flying a plane and more like launching into space. Every takeoff was a controlled leap toward the edge of the atmosphere, where only the bravest and most skilled pilots could survive. The training for this job was absolutely brutal. Pilots had to endure extreme heat, oxygen starvation, and sensory overload that would break most people. They practiced in sealed altitude chambers, learning what to do if their pressure suit failed, because even a tiny tear could mean death in seconds. They learned to think clearly while breathing pure oxygen and to navigate by stars instead of landmarks, because up there, you're closer to space than to the ground. The aircraft itself was just as demanding as the environment. Remember those fuel leaks on the ground? That meant the SR-71 couldn't take off with full fuel tanks. It had to refuel in mid-air once it was flying fast enough that the heated panels sealed themselves. Every single flight began with this weird paradox. A plane that literally couldn't contain itself until it was already screaming through the sky. Pilots often described the SR-71 as a living creature that didn't fly so much as it survived through speed. If you slowed down too much, temperatures would shift, shock waves would collide, and the plane could tear itself apart. Speed wasn't just the Blackbird's advantage, it was its lifeline. From inside the tiny cockpit, surrounded by darkness and stars, pilots said it felt like the fastest meditation in the world, floating at the boundary between Earth and space the most dangerous mission. In April 1986, everything the SR-71 was built for came to the ultimate test. The United States had just launched Operation El Dorado Canyon, a series of airstrikes against Libya in retaliation for terrorist attacks on American targets, but the military needed to know how much damage they had caused, which meant sending someone to photograph the aftermath. The problem was, this would require flying directly over hostile territory where every radar and missile battery was already wide awake and angry. The mission fell to Major Brian Shule and his reconnaissance officer Walt Watson flying SR-71, tail number 17,972. These two men would have to take their aircraft into the most dangerous airspace on Earth, where every enemy weapon was already pointed at the sky, looking for revenge. It was the kind of mission that could easily become a suicide run. Their Blackbird roared off the runway in England and climbed toward the stars, its engines painting twin cones of violet flame against the night sky. As they crossed into the Mediterranean, the cabin shook under the enormous forces of Mach 3 flight. From 85,000 feet up, they could see the curve of the Earth and the borderlines of nations that blurred into darkness. But as they approached the coast of Libya, everything changed. Suddenly, the cockpit alarm screamed and the radar warning receiver flashed bright red. Libya's missile sites had locked onto them. Within seconds, the first surface-to-air missiles launched from the desert below. Soviet-built SA-5s that could reach more than 80,000 feet and were guided by radar powerful enough to track a baseball in orbit. Then came another missile and another. White trails twisted upward like lightning bolts, hunting the black silhouette of the SR-71, outrunning death. At that moment, Brian Schull realized there was only one option, speed. The SR-71 wasn't designed to turn and dodge like a fighter jet. It was designed to outrun death itself. He told Watson to push it up, and they advanced the throttles past limits that most pilots would never dare touch. The Blackbird surged forward like it had been shot from a cannon. Its titanium body began glowing orange from friction with the air. The airframe groaned under forces it had never experienced. The cockpit temperature spiked dangerously high, and outside the windows, 
the horizon blurred into a tunnel of blue flame. They were flying faster than any human had ever flown in combat, pushing the aircraft beyond every specification its designers had ever tested. Every missile that chased them began to fall behind. At over 2,200 miles per hour, the Blackbird climbed even higher, its engines devouring the thin air and turning it into raw power. The missiles simply couldn't adjust to the altitude change fast enough. Their guidance systems failed one by one, and they exploded harmlessly far below, while Shul and Watson watched the light show from what felt like the edge of space. Minutes later, an eerie silence returned to the cockpit. The alarm stopped screaming, the warning lights dimmed, and only the steady roar of the engines remained. The plane had outrun everything Libya could throw at it. When they finally looked down through the camera ports, the photos showed the smoking ruins of the strike targets below, proof that their impossible mission was complete. What Shul didn't realize at that moment was that his desperate burst of speed had carried the SR-71 higher than it had ever gone before, into a place where only spacecraft usually traveled a few hundred miles above them. Astronauts aboard an orbiting shuttle saw a strange glimmer streaking below and wondered what kind of plane could possibly fly that high beyond the sky. As the SR-71 pushed past every limit ever written in its manuals, something extraordinary happened. The aircraft began to change from the intense heat and speed. The skin around the nose turned dull red, then orange, until it glowed like a piece of molten metal. At nearly a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, the titanium panels expanded inches wider than they had been at takeoff. Every rivet and seam was alive with heat that would have destroyed any other aircraft. Outside the cockpit windows, the exhaust from the engines stretched into long blue flames, and the air around the jet shimmered like a heat mirage. To anyone watching from below, the SR-71 looked less like an airplane and more like a comet burning across the edge of the sky. The forces pressing against Shul's chest were enormous, but he had to fly the aircraft with just fingertips, not muscles, because even the smallest steering input could snap the plane in half. As they climbed higher, the sky began to change in ways that few humans have ever witnessed. The deep blue of the upper atmosphere thinned to a violent haze, then to pure black stars appeared overhead, sharp and still, even though it was the middle of the day down on Earth. Shul realized they had crossed into a place that almost no one had ever seen, the boundary where Earth ends and space begins. From their incredible altitude, the world curved visibly beneath them. The Mediterranean stretched like a silver line, with Africa on one side and Europe on the other. The horizon bent in a way that made it clear they weren't just flying high, they were looking down at their home planet. From the perspective usually reserved for astronauts, Shul later said, it felt like they had left Earth entirely. Above them, in low orbit, the crew of an American space shuttle reported seeing something that shouldn't have been possible. Their instruments picked up a dark object, moving below them, gliding just under the atmospheric edge. Through the shuttle's observation windows, it appeared like a massive black arrow cutting across space itself, leaving behind faint trails of ionized air. The astronauts were stunned because there weren't supposed to be any aircraft flying that high, the untouchable legend. At full throttle, in the thin air above Libya, the SR-71 had become something beyond human engineering. The shock waves that normally dragged against its body now slipped past like silk. The radar warning lights that had been blinding just minutes before began to fade one by one as the Libyan missile systems lost their lock on the speeding aircraft. Down below, chaos ruled the desert. Dozens of missiles spiraled upward, their white contrails weaving scars across the sky. But the SR-71's reconnaissance cameras captured the real story. A storm of smoke trails suspended thousands of feet beneath them, frozen against the curve of the Earth. They were flying above the reach of every weapon pointed their way. Each missile that launched that night carried enough explosive power to vaporize a jet twice the size of the Blackbird, but none even came close. Their guidance systems relied on radar reflections, and the SR-71 
was nearly invisible at that speed. Its sleek, angled body scattered radar waves in every direction, while its temperature confused heat-seeking sensors that couldn't decide whether they were chasing an aircraft or the sky itself. What happened over Libya wasn't just luck or good piloting, it was the ultimate proof of everything Skunk Works had built the SR-71 to be, a machine that could outrun fear itself. The numbers from that night and the aircraft's entire career tell an incredible story. More than 4,000 missiles were fired at the SR-71 during its years of service, and not a single one ever hit, not once. That record still stands today, untouched in all of aviation history. For the engineers who had spent years working in secrecy, watching their creation dodge every missile Libya could fire was the ultimate validation. All their radical design choices, the titanium body, the stealth shaping, the jet black heat dissipating skin, worked together to create something that seemed to defy the laws of physics. At Mach 3.5, the SR-71 didn't just escape danger, it erased it completely. The mystery that remains. When the SR-71 finally touched down after its mission over Libya, the landing strip shimmered with heat radiating from the aircraft. The titanium panels clicked and groaned as they cooled, still glowing from their journey to the edge of space. Mechanics approached the jet with awe, seeing scorch marks on the nose cone and wings that still glowed faintly red from the incredible temperatures they had endured. In his mission debrief, Major Brian Schul wrote something that stunned the intelligence officers who read it, that he and Watson had reached the place where the sky ends and space begins. This wasn't poetic language or exaggeration. Flight data confirmed that the SR-71 had maintained controlled flight at an altitude and temperature that should have been impossible for any aircraft designed to fly in Earth's atmosphere. NASA engineers later studied the telemetry data and compared it to their own high-altitude experiments from the X-15 program. What they found defied all expectations. The Blackbird had achieved stable flight in conditions where normal aerodynamics should have collapsed entirely. The aircraft wasn't supposed to be able to do that according to everything they knew about flight, yet somehow it had. To this day, the exact altitude the SR-71 reached that night over Libya remains classified. Some radar readings suggested it flew well beyond 90,000 feet, possibly crossing into what's officially considered the beginning of space. Others dismissed these numbers as instrument errors caused by the extreme speed and thin air. But the question remains, did a human pilot actually cross into space that night in 1986, decades before anyone realized it? The SR-71 was officially retired in 1999 its final flight, closing a chapter that no other aircraft has ever been able to rewrite. More than two decades later, its records still stand completely untouched. It remains the fastest air-breathing manned aircraft ever built, capable of flying above 85,000 feet at speeds over 2,200 miles per hour. No jet built since then, not even the most advanced military prototypes, has broken what Skunk Works achieved with slide rules and raw imagination. The Blackbird's legacy isn't measured only in altitude or speed, but in what it represents about human determination. It was designed to be a spy plane, but it ended up touching the edge of the universe. Even now, decades later, one question continues to fascinate aviation experts and space enthusiasts alike. Did we accidentally cross into space back in 1986 without even realizing it? The SR-71 remains proof that sometimes, when you refuse to accept the word impossible, you end up building something that reaches for the stars themselves. Thanks for watching another episode. While you are still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more quality content.